used by a lot of pet owners. The most common training collar in use today is the prong collar. In fact, in Europe, people actually call it a training collar. I call the prong collar power steering on dogs. While its looks may cause some people to turn up their nose, the fact is it's much more humane than the old-fashioned choke collar. Because of its design, the prong collar will only tighten so far on the dog's neck, about an inch or so, whereas a choke collar will really tighten down hard and over time can cause serious damage to the muscles in the dog's neck. The fact is, the prongs on this collar are not pointed and they don't penetrate the skin. When a correction is given, the force of that correction is dispersed around the circumference of the dog's neck and not just in one specific spot on the neck, which is what happens with a choke collar correction. A prong collar is not slipped over the head of the dog, but rather it's taken apart and wrapped around the neck and then put, ta put back together. To simplify this process, new trainers need to learn to take a collar apart and then put it back together. To take it apart is not difficult. It does not matter what link is taken apart. Simply pinch the ends on one of the links and then pull it apart like you see here. Putting it back together is where people without training run into problems. The secret is to anchor one side of the prong in one of the holes of the opposing link. Then compress the other prong and push it until it slips into the other hole. When you do it correctly, it looks like this. So one more time, let's watch Carmen do this. She anchors the one side in a hole and then pushes the other side until it goes in. When she takes it apart, she pinches the top and pulls it apart. It looks just like that. If you go to my website, you'll also see that we sell a, uh, a series of prong collars that have quick-release snaps on it, so you don't have to take the links apart. You can just clip the, the collar together with a little quick-release snap like you see in this video. It makes it a little bit easier to get it on and off. But once again, it costs a few extra dollars, too. I have an article on my website titled, How to Fit a Prong Collar. I've put the web address on the screen right now. If you have any questions on how to fit a prong collar, you can use this article as a second reference. To get the most effective use of a prong collar, it must be properly fit. So, once you know how to take a prong collar off and put it back on, then you need to learn how to properly fit the prong on the dog's neck. A prong collar needs to fit snugly just behind the ears and just behind the back of the jaw. What it doesn't do is hang loosely on the dog's neck like you see here. Many people mistakenly think they have to buy a prong collar by measuring the dog's neck like they do a choke collar. That's not how it works. A prong collar comes with a certain number of lengths, almost always more than what's needed for the average adult dog. In fact, to get a prong collar to fit snugly, some lengths usually have to be removed from the collar. If you have a young dog, you'll want to save them to add them back in as the dog grows. If you have a mature adult, then you'll probably never need these extra lengths again. If you're a pack rat like me, you'll stick them away someplace and then forget where you put them, or more likely, just forget that you ever had them. The important thing is that once the prong collar is on the dog, it does not hang loosely on the neck. It's, it's got to fit snugly, but not too tight to interfere with the dog's breathing. A couple of words of advice about prong collars and small dogs use them they need them too we sell micro and mini prong collars for very small dogs we have prong collars that are made for dogs under five pounds you can see them on our website these little rascals need to be trained with prong collars just like the biggest toughest german shepherds don't let their size fool you little dogs need a learning phase 
a correction phase, and a distraction phase of training. The fact is, I think little dogs need prongs more often than large breed dogs. It's too easy to have a flat collar on a small dog like this and lift it off the ground with a correction, and they go right on doing what they were doing before. Whereas a little tap with a mini or a micro prong would be all that's needed to have them turn around and say, excuse me, what was it you wanted me to do again? There are two ways to connect a leash to a prong collar. You can either clip the leash both rings on the prong collar, which is the way I recommend. This is called clipping it to the dead ring because the collar will only move about two inches when the leash is pulled tight. Or you can clip it to the live ring, which means it's only clipped to one of the two rings on the prong collar. The reason I don't like the live ring used is that the handler must pull the leash four to six inches before the collar tightens, compared to two inches for the dead ring to tighten. There's a big difference here. Dogs are masters at reading body language. Many dogs will react to six inch movement of the arm before the correction, something we don't want. To give a two inch correction does not involve hardly any movement of the arm. We need to talk about when to put our collars on our dogs and when to take them off. When I talk about this, I am include all three collars. That means flat collar, prong collar, and or collar. New trainers often don't realize how important this is in the learning process. When handlers ignore the situation, they end up with that only find the prong collar or dogs then when the elect is on. Or on the dog, or the fact that the dog knows the collar is coming trigger for the dog to mind. Our goal in training is to have a dog that responds to our voice command and not a dog that responds to an external trigger. New trainers are often advised to simply make their dogs wear a shock collar nonstop for two weeks before training with the shock collar. And that's all they really need to do, they're told, to desensitize the dog to having the collar on. This is not accurate. It's actually bad information. Many times, it's the physical act of putting a collar on the dog that's the trigger, and that's the thing that makes the dog respond differently than it normally would without the collar. So the correct way to desensitize your dog to the collar is accomplished by putting the collar on and taking it off two or three times a day. Do this for two weeks before you actually begin to train with them. Rotate your collars. Put the electric collar dummy on for an hour or so, then put the prong collar on. Then put both of them on. Then put the flat collar on. Sometimes have all three collars on. After two weeks of doing this, your dog is going to totally ignore which collar it's wearing. The last step of the process is for the handler to put the training collar on at least 30 minutes before you're going to train and leave it on for 30 minutes after you're done training. So if you're going to use your prong collar, put it on a half an hour before you go out and train. Or a half an hour before you're going to use your electric collar, make sure that it's on the dog and don't take it off too quickly when you're done. Before I leave the collar section of this video, I need to talk a little bit about a few additional collars. Most of the time, my dogs wear fur saver collars. They look like this. These collars don't cut the hair on the dog's neck as badly as a normal choke collar. So not only don't I like choke collars for the damage they do to the muscles in the dog's neck, I also don't like them because of what they do to the dog's coat. I'm not a fan of halties or head halters. These products are not training collars. For a collar to be a training collar, you must be able to administer a correction with it, and that can't be done with a halty.